Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. It's uh, 5 to 2. So thanks, everyone, for coming to my talk, uh, Density-Based Clustering in Python. My name is Brian Kent. I'm a data scientist at Dado. Uh, we're based in Seattle. Hopefully, you've seen all of our big fuchsia banners everywhere. If not, stop by our booth after the talk. Um, the talk is not really a Dado talk. I'll mention one, uh, one of the tools in Dado, but uh, I really want to talk more about the method today. So I want to talk about density-based clustering, but before I get started on that, uh, a little bit of a baseline about what is clustering. And I think this might be pretty intro for a lot of people, so I'll move pretty quickly through it, but I think it's important to start here. The idea is that we have uh, a bunch of data instances, uh, data points. Um, here I'm using the two moons data uh, drawn uh, with scikit-learn, uh, random state 19. By the end of this talk, you'll be really sick of this data set. I don't want to spend too much time explaining the data, so I'm going to keep using this over and over and over again. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, the point of clustering is to group the data points uh, so that we have similar instances in the same group and dissimilar instances in different groups. Sounds pretty easy, but we don't have a target variable. So we're not going to split this into a training and testing phases. We need to do this uh, without any supervision. And so this is kind of what, the, what we want the answer to be. We've colored the points based on the true uh, groups they were drawn from here. So we want to get some output like this blue and red split. So we're going to assign each point to a cluster. So that's clustering. So why do we do this? And so I started with clustering from an academic context. And in academia, it's sort of presented as an axiomatic thing that we would want to do. It's sort of a foundational or fundamental task in statistics. But now that I'm at a company that's trying to sell a product, I found that it's actually a lot harder to sell clustering as something that commercial users would want to do. Things like uh, recommender systems and uh, classification regression kind of sell themselves, churn prediction, et cetera. Everyone kind of knows what those applications are. But it's been a little harder to find uh, sales points for clustering. So I made a list of the reasons why people do clustering. And if there are others, awesome. Uh, let me know after the talk. I'd love to add to my list. Uh, so the first thing, and someone mentioned this in a lightning talk yesterday, is exploring and visualizing complex data. So clustering is often one of the first things that we do as humans when we start working with a new data set to get some sense of the structure of that data. Another thing that people use clustering for often is to reduce the scale of the data in some way. It can be done in either dimension, either reducing the number of instances or reducing the dimensionality. A very common application, and this is one that does have a lot of commercial use, is detecting outliers, uh, which to me is a flavor of anomalies. There's lots of other types of anomalies. Small clusters, for example, are clusters with small mass but high density. All of these can be considered anomalies. Uh, deduplication is a fascinating clustering example because we often think of clustering as trying to find a small number of groups. In that Moon's example, I have two groups. But deduplication, if you have n uh, records, you might want n minus 2 clusters. There might only be two duplicates or something like that. So it is a clustering problem, but it's a very specific form of clustering, and it's very different from the usual applications. And finally, people often talk about using clustering to segment a uh, market or a user base. Uh, I put this last because I'm not really sure what the purpose is of that. Usually there's some other purpose, but it's the kind of thing where people do clustering because they don't know what else to do to get started. So that, that is a reason to do it. If you don't have anything else to do, try clustering. So there's a few key takeaways from today, uh, now that we've got the basics down. The first is that k-means is not always a good option. And this was, the, I think, the big point of the lightning talk yesterday, so I agree with that completely. Uh, there are reasons to use k-means. Uh, we'll go into that, but it's not always a great option. Uh, and the point of this talk is that density-based clustering is a particular flavor or family of methods that's sometimes a good alternative. dbscan is the most popular form, so I'll spend a lot of time explaining how that works. Uh, level set trees is something that I've worked on for a long time. It's uh, a more powerful method than dbscan, I believe. And finally, I'll go through some code uh, pretty quickly with scikit-learn, uh, with GraphLab Create, and with my own package debacle. So k-means is kind of the default clustering method. And uh, part of the origin for this is, uh, for this talk, is that uh, I was talking to someone in DevOps, and he was talking about how he did a clustering problem for some sort of uh, system. And I asked him why he used k-means, and he said it's because the only thing he knew. And so that was sort of why I wanted to talk about uh, different kinds of clustering, because k-means is the default, but there are other things out there. But why do people do it? Why did it become the default? Well, it's a very simple algorithm, for one. Uh, there, are, there are lots of resources out there uh, to learn about how k-means works. There's lots of implementations, pretty much any uh, generic statistics or machine learning package is going to have some form of k-means clustering in it. 
and it scales very well. So if you have truly massive data, uh, k-means can be a good option, especially with the uh, some more recent implementations of this. Mini-batch in particular can be extremely fast and still yields pretty good results. So as an aside about k-means, if you're doing k-means and you're using the original algorithm, you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, can't guarantee that. I'm sure there's good uses for it, but you're probably doing it wrong. So if you want to know more about that, come see me afterward. OK, so here's an example where k-means is not the only answer. Uh, so the first question we have to ask is, how do we choose k and k-means? And of course, there is uh, something called the elbow heuristic or the gap heuristic, where we're going to try k-means with a bunch of different values of k and find out where the error stops decreasing quickly and choose that as our value of k. And that sounds great uh, in principle, but in practice, it doesn't work that well in my experience. Um, sometimes choosing k is impossible. So deduplication is a great example of this, where uh, if k you know, might be on the range from 2 to 20, it's one thing to try this gap heuristic. If k is on the range from 1 to n, and n is 10,000, it's pretty tough to do that gap statistic. So sometimes choosing k is just impossible, deduplication being a great example. And finally, k-means only finds spherical convex clusters. Uh, and so when we have this two moons example, this is why I chose the two moons example, uh, k-means fails. So here we have clustered with k-means into the red and blue points, and the answer is terrible. Okay, so the next part of the talk is the overview about density-based clustering. Um, and this is sort of what we would want to do with density-based clustering. So don't think about this yet as a specific algorithm. This is a concept about what we would want to achieve with density-based clustering. And the premise here is that the data is drawn from uh, an unknown underlying probability density function. So this is a statistical view of the world. Uh, there is some unknown PDF, and we're drawing data from it. The PDF basically describes for any point in our space how likely it is to draw a data instance from that point. So what we would want to do is take this data and estimate that PDF. So I've drawn uh, our estimated PDF with color here, with contour lines. So it's, you know, where the regions where the data lies in those two moons is where we have high estimated PDF. And what we would want to do is then threshold this PDF, this estimated density function, uh, and we find that upper level set. So here I've cut it at 0.2, and I've taken that region in our space that has a higher estimated density than 0.2. And so from here, what we would like to do is then find the connected components. And so keep this in mind. I'm going to come back to this in a minute. What we would want to do is find the connected components of that upper level set. Then we're going to intersect our original data with that upper level set. So imagine our data in those regions. And then use that intersection to label the data, data points themselves. So this would be our final clustering with our ideal density-based clustering uh, routine. So pros and cons of this idea. First off, uh, we can recover much more complex cluster shapes. So this is the idea that we get these moons, which k-means couldn't do. It could only recover spheres or hyperspheres. We don't need to know k. Uh, so this is a big benefit. Of course, we have to know some other parameters depending on which specific method we choose, but we don't need to know the number of clusters a priori. Uh, we can automatically find outliers. So if you saw on that last, uh, last image, we had some black points that weren't actually assigned to a cluster. That's a good candidate for an outlier. So those are the pros. The cons, uh, we need some sort of function to measure the dissimilarity or the distance between each pair of points or a given pair of points. And so uh, some methods encode this automatically. Other methods allow you to specify it however you want. But we need to have some measure of this dissimilarity. Incidentally, uh, k-means does this implicitly. And so that's one of the problems with it is it can't change it without changing the algorithm. It's not generally as scalable as k-means because we have to compute a lot of those distance functions. And finally, last but not least, it's impossible to do what I just described because computing those topologically connected components uh, is computationally impossible. And so I don't want to get into the details of what I mean by topologically. This is just common sense connected components. We have this region in space. We need to decide if there's any path between these two regions. This is a computationally impossible task. So this is where we start getting into lots of different density-based clustering methods, specific flavors of this. And so because there's no, uh, well, there are several ways to measure the quality of clustering, uh, but it's not nearly as clear cut as something that's supervised, these methods have proliferated. But dbscan is uh, far and away the most popular form of density-based clustering. Um, so dbscan stands for 
density-based spatial clustering of applications with noise. So people assume it has something to do with databases, and there is some distant, loose connection there, but uh, it really is not about databases. It's density-based spatial clustering of applications with noise. Uh, it's from Martin Ester and other authors in 1996, so it's a relatively old algorithm now, but it won the Test of Time Award just last year at the KDD conference. So people are still using this, and in fact, it has amassed 7,400 citations, so it's far beyond the scikit-learn threshold of when to implement a model or not, which is like 200 or so, 300? Oh, okay, good. But isolation forest is, is uh, okay. So the main idea of dbscan, uh, this is again a very high level idea, is that we're going to partition our data into three types of points. We're not gonna, this isn't the clustering yet, but each point is going to be assigned to either the core group, a boundary group, or a noise group. Um, and so the core points are the high density points. These are the points at the center of clusters, loosely speaking. They have lots of neighbors within a certain distance around them. And so the next thing to do is to connect these core points into the clusters, and then to assign the boundary points to a nearby cluster. And the noise points are left as noise. Okay, so now there's a great visualization if my internet is working okay. So I'm gonna click out of here and see if we can get this going. Um, this is not mine. Uh, I don't know the author, but it's a fantastic visualization of how this works sort of on a local scale uh, in a breadth first way as opposed to k-means. So we're gonna start with this very noisy data set here. I'm gonna click the, uh, the parameters up a little bit so it's a little faster. And we're gonna go. So we start with an arbitrary point. We expand the neighborhood around that point to include other core points. Um, and we just keep doing this in a breadth first way until we run out of nearby core point neighbors. And so this blue cluster continues expanding around the outside of the smiley face, uh, even though we've, we're far beyond a convex shape at this point. It will just keep expanding in a local fashion. The red, po the red cluster has already stopped. There's no more neighbors to be found around that cluster. That, this is random noise, so this is not something I've seen before. It's always different, which is cool, but uh, I don't really know exactly how it's gonna go. So hopefully we get some new clusters now with the, the mouth and the other eye. It's moving slowly, slowly, slowly. But it's picking good points for the... Yeah, so it's working well. I mean, the different colors started with something that looks really like an eye and a mouth. Yeah, so it's, I mean, so then these black points are the noise points, um, which aren't going to be assigned to a cluster. And so it, it's, it's fairly robust to that, that order. Um, order does matter, but in a very, very small way. It, more, it matters in how the boundary points are assigned to a cluster um, because they're assigned to the first core cluster that they see. Um, but if it picks a noise point and there aren't sufficient number of neighbors around it, it just moves on to the next point. It marks it as visited and then moves on to the next point. So it's pretty robust to that. So is that pretty clear? I love that illustration. Any questions about that? Yeah. I don't think it was reassigned. I think it was on the edge of red. I think it was a, a weird case, but I don't think it was reassigned. No. Okay. No. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. Right. It shouldn't. I mean, I, I don't, this is Naftali Harris. I don't know who this is. Uh, there could be a bug, but yeah. Yeah, unless there's a bug. I, I don't think it could have been if it's done right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the question is about high dimensional spaces. Um, I'm not sure about the specific, the answer to that specific question, but in general, high dimensional spaces are gonna be problems for these distance-based methods um, because all the distances are gonna look similar as the dimension gets really high. Um, there is a middle ground. I mean, that's part of the reason why we did this in GraphLab Create is because we're trying to expand the usefulness of this method to work with some medium dimension data, uh, like images, for example. Uh, but once you get into really high dimensions, it's not gonna work that well. None of these methods will work that well. It's true. Yep. Uh, 
Oh, OK. So now I wanted to show how to do dbscan and scikit-learn. So I'm going to go back to a Jupyter notebook here. I'm actually going to move this up a little bit. How's the font size? Can people? OK, great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He says it's OK, so it's OK. OK, so we're going to import our libraries, uh, matplotlib, so I can show what's happening. Um, the make moons function from scikit-learn, so I can generate this data, and the dbscan function from scikit-learn. Uh, and of course, we'll use the GB, ggplot style in matplotlib because it's awesome. Uh, not at the moment, but I'll post it. It's a good idea. OK, so here's just the top, top five rows of our data. So just to see what it looks like, we've got an n by 2 matrix here. Um, it's very straightforward in scikit-learn. So this is, uh, I mean, this is really simple code. This is not meant to be a tutorial about how to make super high, awesome, uh, super high level awesome uh, machine learning, uh, you know, whiz bang things. This is pretty simple code. Model equals dbscan. So the, the trick here is the parameters. Um, and so there's two main parameters for dbscan. The first is epsilon, ep eps here, and this defines the size of the neighborhood around each point. Uh, the second is min samples, which is the number of points that have to be within that epsilon neighborhood for a point to be considered a core point. So min samples is basically our density level threshold. So when I picked point two on that contour plot, this is uh, analogous to the min samples value. So we'll make that model and we'll print it. So uh, scikit-learn doesn't print too much when you print the model, but we can see the parameters that we use to make the model. And of course with fit, we've already fit the data to it on the chained operation here. So what comes out of this? Pretty straightforward, model labels. So these are our cluster labels. Um, the rendering's a little strange here, uh, but basically we have ones and zeros because we have two clusters with this moons example. Um, there's one negative one in here. That stands for the noise point. And then, of course, there's the core sample indices as well, which is useful if you want to know which points are the core points. So we can check that this worked pretty well with the matplotlib plot, and we get some strange warning. Uh, but basically, uh, our red point is the noise point here, and the gray and the orange are our clusters. So it works pretty well. Uh, so based on those parameters, the epsilon and min neighbors parameter, um, it's not. So the reason it's noise is that it itself is not a core point. It doesn't have sufficient number of neighbors. But it also, uh, none of its neighbors are core points as well. So it can't be a boundary point. It can't be assigned to uh, one of the core points. So that means that this point is also a boundary point, and this point is probably a boundary point, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. That's a great question. So the second part of the talk is about level set trees, <laughs> uh, which are in part intended to get around that problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it does, it does support more, more distances, which is one of the great features about these distance-based methods. You have to compute some distances, but you can choose your distance. So there's a pretty, pretty wide range of distances. And I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit for the GraphLab create version as well. Uh, the complexity is a funky issue. It's kind of a funny story, because the original paper says that it's n log n if you already have a nearest neighbor's indexing structure where you can quickly look up the region around each point, which is wonderful if you have that. Great. But I don't usually have that. What's funny is there was a paper that came out this year or last year that actually finds a mistake in the original paper and corrects the rates to be worst case n squared. Uh, but in practice, n log n is not a terrible guess. If you have that index, indexing structure, that is the bigger, bigger part. Yeah. Other questions? OK, great. Let's see. OK, so I'm going to go back to the slides real quick and talk a little bit about uh, dbscan and graphlab create. So I guess the big question is, why did we do this if it's already in scikit-learn? Uh, the first thing is we wanted to build this on top of the GraphLab Create S-Frame and S-Graph data structures. So if you've heard Rajat's talk earlier, or you come by the booth, you know that these are our uh, scalable data structures. They're on disk, parallel computation, et cetera. Uh, both open source, both awesome. But we wanted to build a tool that worked with these natively. 
Uh, the second thing is this distance question. So we have this idea of a composite distance because a lot of our customers and users want to work with features that have different types. So they want to work with, say, string data for, say, a house address and uh, Euclidean data for lot size and square footage or something like that. So they have numeric data and they have string data and they want to have some function that measures the, the dissimilarity between two points based on these different features. So Euclidean distance, for example, only works with numeric data. It's not going to work. So we have a composite distance where you can add different distance functions on different sets of features, and this can be sent to dbSCAN as well. That said, there's a big caveat with this, which is that the, the dbSCAN algorithm doesn't explicitly talk about how uh, which properties of distance functions are needed to work well. But if you give it a weird, really weird distance function, you might get really weird answers back. That's the, that's the caveat. And the third thing is, uh, so the original algorithm, if you noticed, well, I didn't talk about it in great detail, but basically is doing a connected component search on a graph. And so we thought by doing that connected component search directly, we could use a more efficient algorithm and speed up the, speed up the process a little bit. And in fact, when we wrote it, it was, pretty, it was faster than scikit-learn. Scikit-learn has made some great improvements, so it's pretty much on par at this point. So I would say that's a wash. Uh, and lastly, of course, uh, dbSCAN and GraphLab Crate is not open source, but free for non-commercial use and free to try. So <laughs> check it out. Okay, and now I, wanted, now I wanted to show off what that looks like in GraphLab Create as well. Okay, so again, I don't want to worry too much about the, the uh, S-frame code here. I'm importing GraphLab. I'm converting it to our S-frame, the NumPy array into an S-frame. I'm going to create a model. I get a little bit of output here. Uh, and then we're going to look at the summary of that model. This is the key thing that I like to look at here. So this gives us some sense of what went into our model. So we have a number of examples. This is the schema of the model, so to speak. A uh, number of columns. We have two columns in our original data set. Uh, we have our parameters, our radius parameter. We call it radius instead of epsilon. Uh, and the min, min number of neighbors to be a core point, our density level threshold, um, training time, et cetera. So how do we use this? Well, we get a table that describes the cluster ID for each point, and we also get a column in this that indicates the type of the point. So this can be useful as well if you want to, say, plot your data by instance type. So if you want to look at, say, the boundary points, which are points where you might have less certainty about which cluster it belongs to, or noise points, for example. So I'm going to do that. The machinery here isn't too important. Let's, let's ignore that for now. Um, I just wanted to show how you would use this result to make a plot with the boundary points here. So in this plot, the gray now is the boundary points, according to the dbSCAN algorithm. The red points are the core points. And again, we have this orange point, which is our noise. Sorry for the changing colors. I'm still getting used to the matplotlib uh, color maps. Any questions at this point? Great. OK, so there's one other example I wanted to show here, which is starting to get into that idea of different distances. And here, it's sort of deduplication. I'm using the term deduplication loosely. Um, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a small sample of Wikipedia articles here. Uh, pardon the rendering again. And the, the titles, for some reason, lost their spaces. But this is title and then text, so aquaculture. And then output is reported from aquaculture world, et cetera ad hominem, et cetera. So this is some random sample of Wikipedia articles, the text of Wikipedia articles. And there's a little bit of feature engineering. I'm going to convert this into a bag of words representation. Uh, details aren't super critical. If you're interested, please talk to me afterwards. Um, so now, instead of just a long string of text for each article, we have a dictionary which represents the number of times that each word appears in, our, in each article. That is going to go, well, we're first going to remove some stop words. And then we're going to create the dbSCAN model. And I'm not going to do it here. It takes about a minute. I want to keep moving. Uh, but I'm going to load a pre-trained model. But the idea is here I'm using Jacquard distance. I'm not using Euclidean distance. So I've changed it up. So yep. the GL is your graph That's graph lab create. Yep. Yep. And so here my radius is 0.6. So with Jacquard distance, I actually have some intuition about what that means. Basically, the ratio of the intersection of the words and the union of the words between two articles has to be a certain level. Um, so I'm going to load this model. It's already been trained. I'm going to show you the summary. Uh, we have 14,500 articles, roughly. We have 112 clusters. So this isn't exactly db, uh, deduplication, rather, but it's closer to that than the other applications. Um, <clears throat> 
So one thing I wanted to touch on real quickly, this is the Canvas feature in GraphLab Create. So I wanted to show basically the distribution uh, on the cluster ID. So first of all, there's 14,000 of our 14,500 that are undefined. These are the noise points. So this clustering routine found a lot of noise, which is OK in a deduplication case. The noise doesn't mean it's bad. It just means we didn't find any things to cluster it with. Um, and we can look at the distribution of clusters here and see that it's pretty uh, skewed. So there's one set of clusters, one set of articles that are really similar to each other, and the rest are kind of all in their own little world. I'm going to go back. Uh, and I wanted to explore the clusters now just to show you what these clusters look like. So I'll join the original data back to my cluster IDs, and then I'll print some of these out. And you can see that uh, this particular cluster, number 10, is uh, National Historic Places. So Glencoe, Maryland, it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Douglas Place was listed on the National Histor Historical Register, National Register of Historic Places. So we have some reason to believe that this is working, even with a non-traditional distance on some fairly complex data. Questions at this point? OK, cool. You went yeah. a little fast through the Jupyter page. I did. I did. It would be nice if it was on somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah? How well does this scale uh, out of core data? Um, so that's a good question. So it scales. So the big challenge, there's two pieces to this. There's finding the nearest neighbors for each point, so the all point nearest neighbors. And then there's finding the connected components in the graph. Those are the two big pieces. And so uh, the nearest neighbors part is sort of its own well-studied problem. It can scale depending on the attributes of the data. Um, it's not all pairs necessarily. So it's not necessarily an n-squared problem. Um, but it's, it is computationally uh, expensive. Um, the connected components um, is, is, I mean, is, is not nearly as bad, but also takes some time. Yeah, Andreas. Right now, it's brute force. Yeah. So we don't have uh, the dual tree enabled yet, um, partly because we want it to be as general as possible. Um, so we should be, uh, one of the next steps is to make this a bit more automated in terms of which indexing structure is used for the nearest neighbors part. Uh, right now, it's brute force because it's the most flexible. So you want to go to dual tree for computation? Yeah. Yep. Yep. OK, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and talk about why dbscan is not perfect itself and why level set trees are better than dbscan. This is a bit of a, a, an aggressive claim. I'm not really that aggressive about it, but I'm trying to get the message across. So <laughs> I'm sure dbscan aficionados in the room, we can have a great argument about this. Uh, that's not really the point. So again, how do we choose those parameters in dbscan? Uh, the density level in particular. Epsilon, OK, I can say how you might have some sense for what a radius might be. Like with Jacquard distance, you might have some common sense uh, intuition about what that might be. But how do you choose a density level? I don't know. Uh, if you need to change the density level, the min neighbors parameter, you have to start from scratch with dbscan. So level set trees uh, is something I worked a bit on in grad school. They describe the entire hierarchy of the density-based clusters. They allow you to retrieve clusters in different ways and repeatedly without starting from scratch. The tree, once the tree is computed, it exists and you can just query it as many times as you want in whatever way you want. You don't need to recompute it. Each cluster can have a different density level. So one of the issues with dbscan is you have to pick a flat level. With these trees, you can pick clusters at different levels. So if you have clusters that have different densities, you can re retrieve all of them. And this is a very useful visualization of high dimensional or complex data. Um, so dbscan, you can plot the points back in feature space, but you don't really have a great sense for what the structure is of the data. Um, the hierarchy gives you a better sense for that topological structure of the data. OK, so how do you build a level set tree? Um, this is first some text bullets about the process, and then I'll show a little bit of illustration on the two moons data. So first, we're going to estimate the PDF at each point. This is like we started off with our original density-based clustering concept. We estimate the PDF at each point. We're going to construct a similarity graph on the data, similar to what dbscan implicitly is doing. Um, where, so the similarity graph, if you're not familiar, each vertex is going to stand for one of the data points. And we'll put an edge between a pair of data points if they are neighbors of each other. 
we're going to then filter through this graph. And the way we do this is we're going to remove vertices in order of estimated density. So we'll take the minimum estimated density point and we'll take it away from the graph and all the edges that are attached to it. And as we do that, we'll compute the connected components. So very similar so far to dbscan, but we're going to keep track of these components between levels. And as it happens, they make a tree. So here's kind of what it looks like uh, with our standard two moons data. So we have the same data set. I've colored it by estimated density. So the, the warmer colors, the darker reds, are higher estimated density. The lighter whites are lower estimated density. So that's the first step. Now I've constructed a similarity graph. And I've represented this with black lines between pairs of points. And so the thing to know here is that we have one component. We have one cluster at this level, at level zero, basically. Yes? So I used the k-nearest neighbor similarity graph. So, if, so for a pair of points, if either one is one of the other's k-nearest neighbors, I drew a line between them. Okay, so because there's one component, we have one uh, cluster represented in our tree. There's no tree yet. This is the root of the tree. Okay, so now this is the low density point, circled in blue. So basically what happens here, to step back, three things can happen. Three? One of several things can happen when a point is removed. <laughs> Either nothing can happen, which is what happens in this case. So we take it out. The one component stays the same. Nothing changes. So we represent that with another point on our tree. Um, it's the same, same place horizontally, but just a little higher, because that, that point had a particular density. And it was 0.07. It's very hard to see, but it was 0.07. So now we've put our, put our dot there. So we keep doing that, and nothing is happening, until suddenly we remove an, one more point, and now a different thing has happened. Our first cluster has died, and we've split into two clusters. So we were, the way we represent on the tree is, first, I'm not going to use these points. I'm just going to represent that one cluster by a horizontal line. And then I'm going to have a split represented by, or a vertical line. The split is represented by a horizontal line. So now we have two clusters growing from those branches. But now we do this again. We remove points one by one by one. Nothing has happened in either one of those clusters until we have two points left. Our tree kind of looks like this. We remove that one point. This is the third thing that can happen. A cluster disappears. It didn't split. It just vanishes. So those are the things that can happen as we filter through this graph. We end up with this tree structure. Kind of looks like a field goal for the two moons case. Doesn't always look like that. So that's, that's kind of the basic idea. Um, what it looks like in code, let's switch to debacle here. Again, we're going to make the same data set. <clears throat> So I've imported debacle as DCL here, just for syntactic brevity. I'm going to use the construct tree command. So it takes data. It takes this parameter k, which is a connectivity parameter analogous to epsilon in dbscan. This is the parameter that I used to build that k-nearest neighbor graph. This is k. Uh, pruning threshold is not really related to the density level or the connectivity, but basically what happens if we don't prune, we get a lot of little tiny leaves with one or two points in them. So I'm just going to say, if a leaf has fewer than 10 points, just merge it with its siblings. Just makes the tree a little smoother. So we'll make this tree and then we'll print it. Well, that's, that's terrible. Let me shrink it a little bit. Basically, the tree, this, the point is not to digest uh, all of the numbers in this tree. The point is that this is all of the information in the tree. It's a very compact data structure. Three lines in a table. That's all it is. Well, the size here hides the fact that we keep the indices of the points that belong to each of those nodes as well. But then we plot it, and we get our, our field goal again. So to retrieve clusters, we can do this in one of many ways. So this is the get clusters method, uh, get clusters function, and it takes a method parameter. And first, we're going to do this with leaf. So leaf, leaf clusters are just the ones that are the leaves of the tree. These are the high-density modes of the tree. So we'll get those. Uh, I printed the first five just to show you what it looks like. The first column, the left column, is the row index. The second column is the cluster label, an integer label. And then I'll plot those to show you what it looks like. Again, so we have the same output. Life is good. 
Notice that we don't have all of the points plotted. So the points that were pruned off before we split are not part of this clustering right now. Those are the noise points. And of course, we can then go back and replot this tree so that our colors match. So here we have red and gray. Those red and gray points came from the red and gray leaves of this tree. So the next thing we might want to do is identify outliers. So let's go back and find points that are low density and so instead of finding the high density clusters. And so one way we can do, we can do this is again, the uh, tree get clusters method. We'll do the upper level set. One thing you might want to do is look at the points that are in the bottom 5%. So what are the low 5% density points? So that's what I'll do here. I'll cut at a single density level, much like dbscan does, uh, and I'll get the, the, the 0.05 percent points. So these are those points. These are the low density points. And then we can plot those same plot as before, but now I've added those in black. So now we found our low density points. So I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Let me hold off because I just have one more slide um, or a couple more slides, one more concept here. Um, that's the basics, but you might say, okay, well, dbscan was already pr pretty good at finding two clusters. Pretty much any parameter in there, we would have found two clusters. So why do we really need level set trees? Well, here's an example of much more complex data. So these are hurricane tracks in the Atlantic from 1950-ish to 2014-ish. Um, I've plotted them according to some estimate of density. Let's not get into specifics about density on functions, but uh, even with some coloring about the the density, it's still really hard to figure out what's going on in this data set. We cannot visualize this and see the structure. There's just too much overplotting going on. So we'll make the tree in the top or upper left. We get those leaf clusters. We plot those clusters back in our original feature space, and we have a much better sense of the organization of these tracks. So that's pretty much it. Uh, debacle is my own thing. Pip install debacle. Help is definitely wanted if you're interested in playing with this stuff. Um, the wrap up, just to reiterate, k-means is not always the best option. Sometimes it is, but think twice before you do it. That's all I'm asking. Uh, Density-based clustering can be a good alternative. DB scan is the place to start if you're just start getting started with, with density-based clustering. Uh, check out code in scikit-learn, graph lab create, and check out level set trees in debacle if you're interested. Thank you very much. Okay, a few minutes for questions. I started with a completely connected component and then into a web. Is there any incremental algorithm for finding uh, substructures with reducing density? Uh, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Uh, so, uh, you have to go back and do the connected component algorithm and run the repeater. Repeat yeah, yeah, so in fact, I have to. Yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, in fact, I have to admit that right now the implementation is pretty dumb and does find connected components at every level. But in fact, a union find data structure, a disjoint data structure, would be a much better way to do this. So there is uh, prototype code on GitHub for this. I just haven't sped it up yet. I haven't optimized it so that it's actually faster than the connected components version. But it is computationally a more efficient way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. I, it's, a very, it's a long answer, and I completely smoothed over it. So I just used the points in space, so the geochords for each point. So each of these hurricane tracks has somewhere between 10 and 100 or so points. Um, so it's a variable number of points, which makes it a little bit trickier. Uh, and I used a distance called max average min, sometimes called chamfer distance, uh, to measure the distance between any pair of tracks. Yeah, Andreas. So the method, uh, you developed that, right? Yeah. It's, so there's a paper by Chadri and Dasgupta from UC San Diego, I think, 2010-ish, uh, that has a, an algorithm, but it's a very theoretical algorithm. It has continuously varying variables from zero to infinity, and uh, it's very computationally inefficient. So I modified it a bit to be a bit more reasonable for practical use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Great, thank you.